One of the most powerful tools that can be used in editing astro images is that of compositing, which is found in layer-based editors such as Photoshop and Affinity Photo. The power of compositing allows you to do incredible things with processing your images, preserving color and detail that would be almost impossible to do when working with a single layer image. Today I'm going to demonstrate that power using data I gathered on the Rosette Nebula about a month ago during a moonless night when I was able to keep the telescope trained on the Rosette for about 11 hours. I was using an 81mm Williams Optics Zenith Star and a Player One Uranus C OSC camera. This is quite a large nebula and the only way to squeeze it into the field of view of that telescope and camera combination was to shoot a two-frame mosaic. I've already gone through the process of putting the mosaic together. And now I'm just using spectrophotometric color calibration to correct the color. This is not really a topic for this video, but if you've ever struggled to use spectrophotometric color calibration on a mosaic and failed, go back into your image plate solver script and beneath the image parameters section in the part called image scale, select the resolution option. This will have the image solver solve for the correct resolution of your image rather than the focal length. Otherwise, with the mosaic, Focal length will only confuse the image solver operations. Of course, you do have to make sure that your pixel scale is correct, but that too is a topic for another video. But as you can see, spectrophotometric color calibration has done its job here and given us a pretty well corrected version of the Rosette Nebula. I can see that there is some green in the space, but we'll correct that elsewhere with curves. I don't want to use SCNR on it. SCNR is kind of a brute tool and I want to preserve the subtle colors within the nebula itself. So the next thing to do is create a deconvolved star plate that we'll set aside for use later. And I'm going to show you a very advanced way to go about doing this. We're going to get deconvolved stars. And I like the brightness of the stars in the original plate as they appear right now, relative to the brightness of the nebula itself. So we're going to use a simple technique to match the brightness of those stars to the nebula. The first step is to run the blur exterminator. Then we'll run the noise exterminator and finally extract the stars with star exterminator. So the deconvolved stars have been extracted into a plate that I've labeled stars BXT and I've also cloned that plate. We're going to use the stars BXT plate as a reference to show us what the brightness of the stars should look like. And then in the stars BXT clone plate, we'll undo the screen transfer functions histogram stretch open up the histogram transformation tool and apply an actual histogram stretch. I always prefer to do this manually so I can see the outcomes myself. I'm not quite so inclined to trust automation and I just trust my own eye to give me better results than any computer's programming. Always remember, if you're using automation, you're using the software creator's vision, which isn't necessarily wrong, but it is the software creator's vision. Apply your own, make it your work of art. So with the stars BXT plate lower right to serve as a brightness reference, I'm going to go ahead and stretch the histogram on the stars BXT clone plate until the stars on the clone plate match the proof plate. We'll just speed through the process of adjusting and applying the histogram here. It only takes under a minute and it's very easy. We're just going to move the middle icon on the histogram transformation tool to the left closer to the light curve until the stars match the brightness of the proof plate. And voila! Now we'll save the stars BXT clone plate as a TIFF and set it aside till we're ready to put it back into the image. Now we'll shrink the stars and get them out of the way till we need them again. And on that nebula plate, we're going to undo a lot of what we just did. We're going to undo star exterminator, noise exterminator, and then blur exterminator. And take the mosaic back to the point just after we ran the spectrophotometric color calibration. Then we'll run star exterminator again, this time getting non-deconvolved stars and we'll toss that non-deconvolved plate. Then we'll stretch the nebulous histogram using the histogram transformation tool. I've covered this in detail in my video on how to obtain perfect histograms in 60 seconds. I'll provide the link here. But put simply, we're going to open the histogram transformation tool. And on that tool, we're going to move the leftmost icon up to the beginning of the light curve. Then we're going to move the middle icon up to the right side of the light curve. Watch for outlier data. Often there are very small blips of data just outside the main light curve. Sometimes you want to keep them, sometimes not. If they are further away from the main light curve than the width of the base of the light curve, I usually find it not worth it to keep them in there. Once you have the left and middle icons in place, just go ahead and action that process and the histogram transformation will be applied to the image. 
This process is not typical of the usual way that astrophotographers are advised to do histograms. To be honest, I think the way that's usually recommended is dated and inefficient. This process, the one I've just described, is going to result in a flat image, like one sees in raw images out of a prosumer camera, and the light curves produced by these types of histograms lend themselves to developments with tools such as the Curves Transformation Tool and the development tools found in more traditional image developers such as Capture One, Photoshop, Lightroom, and Affinity Photo. In fact, it can accurately be said that I tend to treat PixInsight like Lightroom is to Photoshop, a place to do initial development but not to finish images. Once the histogram is done, we'll action the process on the image and then move on to the Curves Transformation Tool. The Curves Transformation Tool is the single most powerful tool at the disposal of any photographer, including astrophotographers. And with an understanding of the theory of that tool and how to apply it, you can accomplish almost anything. You'd be amazed what you can accomplish. Using the Curves Tool, you can almost dismiss mass. You can sharpen up images. You can even emulate deconvolution, a process I'll go into in a future video. In this image, however, I'm going to attempt to make a single image that portrays the stronger reds on the outside of the Rosette Nebula, but pulls the greens out of the middle a little to show the blues hidden within. If you watch on the Curves tool how much I'm struggling with it, you can see what a problem this is. I can do it, but the reason that I'm having problems with it is I have to alter the image so much that small regions of the image are becoming hypersaturated and losing sharpness. You can see loss of sharpness here in the violet region, center right and lower center. Much of the detail has been washed out by way of hypersaturation. This happens because of the way color is made in cameras and the way it's portrayed in imaging devices, such as the computer monitor or tablet monitor you're probably watching this video on right now. There are groups of pixels, usually red, green, green, and blue. And the intensity of those pixels is altered so that our eyes perceive one color or another predominating. Too much alteration must come at the loss of other kinds of detail, such as the subtle differences between dark and light areas that causes our minds to see details, such as resolution. Now I could take this image and run Noise Exterminator and Blur Exterminator on it, and the results would be passable, but they wouldn't be great. I want a truly great image. I want an image that gives me the best of both colors. The red that predominates on the outer side of the rosette and the blues hidden beneath the yellow in the center. But I also want an image that preserves the all important detail and contrast. And you know what? There's a better way to get those. What we're going to do is create two plates of the nebula and develop them separately. One of those images will be developed entirely to favor the reds on the outside. And the other image will be developed to entirely favor the blues on the inside. This will allow us to bring out the best of those colors and retain the sharpness on both sides of the equation. So what I'm going to do is go back to the image where it was just after the histogram was actioned, and I'm going to clone the image. Then I'm going to process a curve specifically focused on bringing out the beautiful reds on the outside. Now we have a red predominant plate of the rosette done. Let's take a closer look at it and see what difference this made. There, zoomed in at the heart of the rosette, notice right center and lower left in the violets. That lightning-like detail is better preserved this time. We don't have the color in the center that we want. The color that we want is on the outside, but that's fine. What matters here is processing a separate plate that favored a single color that we're after has given us that color where we want it and given us better detail all around the image. Let's go ahead and make the blue plate. One of the things I really love about PixInsight is it has an absolutely superb curse transformation tool. I'm just amazed that so little has been made of this tool. It's, it's almost treated like an appendix in so many tutorials. But anyway, I've worked a lot with the curves tool over the years and have a good understanding of the color wheel relationship and how to apply the curves transformation tool to changing those relationships and affecting specific ranges of color and luminance. So this whole process goes pretty quickly and leaves us with a final result that looks like this. In this image, we have the beautiful blues toward the center that we were looking for. And once again, we have the sharpness and detail that we were after. Again, look center right and lower center where the colors are most intense. You can see the very fine preservation of detail, not just in the lightning-like formations, but in what could be described as the subtle brush strokes and the movements of the gases. Of course, we don't have the color that we were looking for on the outer part of the nebula, but that's okay, we're going to get that back. With the lion's share of processing finished on the blue and red plates, it's time to clean them up. 
To do so, we're going to run Noise Exterminator and then Blur Exterminator on them again. Noise Exterminator will do a beautiful job cleaning up any lingering noise. And Blur Exterminator, run at the end of image processing, will do a beautiful job sharpening up the image. Then later on, we can take those deconvolved stars from that star plate we made at the beginning of this entire process and add them back into the image. So here are two panels lined up side by side. The red panel looks acceptable. The space is nice and dark, so I'm just going to go ahead and save that image and get it out of the way. The blue panel has a little blue and maybe a little green in the space, so I'm just going to cut that out real quick. I almost never use a mask. Rather, applying the power of the Curves Transformation tool, I will just deduct that unwanted blue out of the black space by creating a shallow concavity on the very low side of the Curves tool on the blue and green channels and restoring the shape of the Curves function up the middle diagonal of the box, which will have the effect of neutralizing color out of the darkest parts of the image, which is the space around the nebula, but preserving the color as it is within all the brighter regions. This is a much more powerful technique than using something like a range mask. A range mask will just consider luminance and luminance can cross over color thresholds easily. Using curves to remove unwanted brightness and color can allow you to very specifically withdraw certain amounts of color from very specific regions of luminance. I sometimes use masks, but it's pretty rare. Now I'll speed through the rest of the curves adjustment, action the process, and you'll see like magic, the space around the Rosette Nebula turned black. So now I've created and saved a histogram and curves balance star plate and two plates of the Rosette Nebula, one with the blue and sharpness that we're after and one with the reds and sharpness that we're after. And I've switched over to my favorite photo editor, Affinity Photo, where I've imported the three images, which appear as layers on the right. And here, I'm going to do the final editing on these images. Using Affinity Photo's powerful composite options, I've set the star plate for a screen composite, which allows the stars to show over the other images. Then I made the blue layer invisible by turning it off. We're going to quickly edit the final appearance of the red plate. We'll start off by dragging a curve tool into the plate and increasing saturation and contrast just a little by tightening up a very, very slight S-curve on the curves tool. I want to enrich the reds just a little bit, but I'm being very, very careful not to do so to the point where we lose sharpness in the image. I want to preserve this beautiful sharpness at all costs. And when I think I've gone as far as I can with the curves tool, I'm just going to open up the vibrance and saturation tool. There, I'm going to crank up the vibrance just a bit, which increases saturation selectively, which helps avoid saturation clipping. It's that clipping that can affect sharpness. Yes, that's about what I'm looking for. Now we'll go into the blue layer and run a very similar process. What I'll do different here though, is I'll import the white balance tool and cool the blue layer. Without changing saturation levels, this will shift all the colors over into a blue. And while that won't do any favors to the reds on the outside, it will work nice for the blues in the interior of the image. And then, just as I did on the red layer or plate, I'll crank up the vibrance just a little bit to brighten the blues while protecting the sharpness. In the end, we're going to end up with two plates that look like this, with the contrast and vibrance of the outer reds intensified but preserving sharpness, and the blues of the inner region intensified also with a focus on preserving sharpness. Now we're going to select the blue layer, which is over the red layer, and blend the blue layer into the red layer. On the middle right of the Affinity Photo desktop, right over the Layers panel, we'll find the compositing options. We're going to go all the way to near the bottom and select the Average Compositing option. This will average saturation and luminance between the two layers, so the predominant reds on the outside will be favored, the predominant blues on the inside, and the image will dim a little. And the average blending composite method will make any transition subtle so they fit together naturally. Still, compositing with the average option has also worked to mute colors on both sides. That's okay, we can easily get them back. We're just going to open another vibrance tool, put it below the stars layer because we don't want to change the stars, they're pretty well perfect as they are but it's going to affect everything else. And then we're going to crank the vibrance way up. Vibrance mostly adds to the brightness of a color or its intensity, but it protects against saturation clipping, which can wash out sharpness. This will give us more brilliant blues and more brilliant reds. And in those places in between where colors merge, well, the result itself is also quite lovely. We've also cranked up the saturation, but just a little bit, just enough to really assist the vibrance. We're being very, very careful with the saturation. We don't want to oversaturate because that doesn't look attractive and it comes at the expense of lost sharpness. 
Then we're going to open the HSL tool. That's a tool for shifting colors. We're going to shift the reds just a little deeper into the red side of the spectrum to intensify them a little bit without adding to saturation. This helps us to get the colors in the outer regions that we're after while also preserving sharpness. I really want to preserve the sharpness. I have developed this image with the intention of being able to preserve that sharpness and zoom in a great deal on it and have the image still look good. And finally, when the HSL is adjusted, we're just going to run a quick crop. Get those two obvious black bars on the left and right sides out of there. Those are leftovers from the mosaic procedure. And we'll get the almost invisible upper and lower bars out of the image as well. Those are artifacts left over from dithering. Affinity Photo has an incredible cropping tool. It's very fast and efficient. This only takes moments. Now at this point, we're pretty much done with the image. Let's take a moment and look at a true color rendition of the image. This isn't so much true color, more it's what the naked eye would perceive. All the colors saturated straight up with the luminance. We can see those lovely reds on the outside of the rosette, which have been preserved in my processing technique. And we can see those yellowish hues toward the center of the image. And what we did was, using the digital color filtering technique that we discussed in the previous video, extracted some of the red and a little bit of the green out of there, leaving the blue colors hidden underneath giving us two plates shown here, which, by processing each of them separately, we could play to their strengths and preserve their sharpness and really bring out the best of their color. And then, by using Affinity Photo's powerful composites option, we average these two images together, yielding a final image that gives us the best of both. So, to preserve the color and the detail and the sharpness this well, we went through a lot of extra work. Was it worth it? I'll let you be the judge. Thank you for watching. I know I go about developing differently, so if you have any questions, please let me know. Now, get out there and shoot the sky.